Good morning. It is a delight and a joy to be with you this Lord's Day. We're going to continue our study in the book of Mark. If you turn with, chapter, with me to chapter 3. A couple of passages stand out to me from the portions that we've looked at up to this point. In chapter 1, after the driving out, driving out of evil spirits, the people respond, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? In chapter 2, after healing the paralytic, and he stands up and walks out in their presence, their response is, we have never seen anything like this. The question comes, who is this? And in other places in the Gospels, that very question is asked. He even commands the waves and the wind and they obey him. Who is this? We've seen that Mark begins his gospel by declaring that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's affirmed through the Old Testament prophets, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, through John the Baptist, chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, by God himself at the baptism, chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, and his works and his power declare it. His power over Satan in the wilderness temptation. His power over demons possessing uh, those who possess the man in the synagogue. And that was their response there. His power over disease as he heals Peter's mother-in-law. His power over sin as he transforms lives. And his power over the Sabbath and that he is the Lord of the Sabbath as we've seen in the past two weeks. At the calling of Matthew or Levi, I happen to have a grandson, Levi. He's in children's church, though, so he, he won't mind that I'm referring to him here this morning. <coughs> it ends Jesus' first year of ministry. And where we are, we're beginning his second year of ministry, and, and this is particularly and often referred to as the year of popularity. And we see that demonstrated in our passage this morning. I dare say that the elders who have chosen these portions for us to study have chosen to give the longest portion to the most long-winded preacher, myself. (laughs) We're going to read through it anyway, and we'll do the very best we can. Not my job. If you turn to chapter 3, we're going to begin then with verse 7. We'll read through verse 19. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. And a large crowd from Galilee followed. And when they heard all that he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him, to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. I'm sorry. You are the Son of God! That was crying out. But he gave them strict orders not to tell them who he was. When Jesus went up, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those that he wanted. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve, designating them apostles that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve that he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot who would betray him. Let's pray. Lord God, we are a dependent people. We would know nothing of you except for what you have revealed to us. And we have the privilege of reading the written word which speaks of the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and every page of this book speaks of him, points us to him, that we might more clearly see and understand who he is and what he did for us. Being God in the flesh and yielding himself to the sacrifice of death, humbling himself that he might purchase us as a people for himself. And Father, we thank you for the privilege and the freedom we enjoy this morning to gather openly together to turn our hearts and our minds and our attention to you. Speak to us, we ask, through your word. May your spirit use everything that is said this morning for your honor and glory. For it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ himself we ask these things. Amen. <clears throat> My outline this morning is fairly simple. Jesus withdraws to two places. One, to the sea. And two, to the mountain. But there are a number of things we see <coughs> in those instance, instances. Verses 7 and 8, Jesus withdrew his disciple with his disciples to the lake. And we read there that a large crowd from Galilee followed him. And when they heard all that he was doing, many people came to him from Jerusalem, Judea, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. We call this the year of popularity. We can begin to see why, because his ministry, in a time in which there was no internet, there were no cell phones, telephones, telegraph, there was barely correspondence, and his, the knowledge of who he was and what he was doing spread from the entire northern country of, excuse me, of, all right, Syria, that's what I needed to say, thank you, from Syria to the far west portion of Israel, to the far right beyond the Jordan, which is where most of the Decapolis, the ten cities were, all the way down beyond Israel to Idumea, or what's known as Edom, the land of Edomites, from Jacob and, and Esau, is where that comes from, from Esau. His, it says here in our passage that people from everywhere came to him. They came to find him. Well, why were they coming? Well, one of the primary reasons we see is that he healed all who came. And when I think about this, and I, I think of the, the masses, and I can't even comprehend the numbers that must have swarmed just to come to touch the tassels of his prayer shawl as a rabbi, to come and to touch as the lady who had been bleeding for... Twelve years just longed to touch the hem of his garment, believing that she would be healed. Thousands. And you know, this is in a day and age in which there was practically no medical help. Folks, we live in an amazing time. I mean, the simplest infections would undermine any one of us a hundred years ago. Our lives would be lost over the simplest of things. <clears throat> and yet, in this day and age, when medical knowledge and ability has, has exploded, yet, if you spend very much time around either a nursing home or hospitals, or I tell you, even in this congregation, there are an awful lot of sick people. So many sick people. Sick and the their lives are hanging in the balance daily because as much as we know, we know so little. And so at a time when there was no hope for epileptics, we're told, for paralytics, for the blind, for the deaf, he healed them all, we're told, in Matthew. That's what he was doing. He was healing what was the purpose, though, of this healing? Let's consider it. Well, first principle is, number one, it was foretold. It was prophesied. 
And we look back to Isaiah 53, verse 4, where it says that surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. Now, there are a number of religious groups that love to claim this verse, and they apply it to today in that saying that believers, because Jesus bore all of our infirmities, we should never be sick. Well, I've contracted another lung problem just this week, so I'm not sure where I fit in that deal. I'm fighting that here, but graciously God has allowed me to be clear enough to be with you this morning. And you and I know that from personal experience and, and, and observation that many believers suffer and die and are incapacitated for years. So we know that, that not all of our physical infirmities have been born away at the cross. We live in a sin-sick world, and we live under the consequences of sin. We read, though, in 1 Peter 2.24... Peter addresses this same verse, and he points to the spiritual aspect of healing from our sin. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness, for by his wounds you have been healed. And Peter's pointing us directly to the fact that we have been and are being healed from our sin and its consequences and its effects. We get to see God transform lives, take brokenness and make us whole in every respect, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in every, every aspect of our lives. God is in the business of restoring but the second reason that we see that Jesus healed was because it was proof. It was proof demonstrating who indeed he was. It put the stamp of approval upon everything that he spoke, everything that he claimed. <clears throat> he healed during his earthly ministry, proving that he was God in the flesh, and it verified his words. John 10, 37 says, Jesus is speaking, he says, Don't believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even if you don't believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. It proved his miracles, his works proved who he was and what he was saying. We see that throughout the New Testament, God confirmed his word to the apostles, uh, the word of the apostles through wonders, signs, and miracles. In Hebrews 2, and th chapters, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, the writer of Hebrews says this, How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It's interesting to note there, just an aside, that the author of Hebrews uses a very specific past tense when he declares that. God testified past tense to it by signs, wonders, and miracles. It doesn't mean that he cannot do those things today. We know that he does, that he intervenes at times. But I do not see the kinds of gifts of miracles, signs, and wonders that we see during this ministry of Jesus and the apostolic time. Oh, I see a lot of people claiming it. I see a lot of people on TV. I don't see them in the hospitals. I don't see them in the nursing homes. I don't see them doing what <clears throat> the apostles did in the New Testament. And even later on in Mark 16, we're told that the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them, and he confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. There it is again. The purpose of these miracles was to confirm the word of God. That's wonderful for us to see and to understand. 
<clears throat> well, we see first that we've, we've seen Jesus withdraw to the sea. He heals, but he did something else. And in verses 9 and 10, we read this. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those who with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Now, the question comes is, what was the purpose? Why a boat? Well, twofold that I see. It formed a natural barrier. If the people were thronging him, <clears throat> they would, my goodness, they would just push and they, would, they could stampede <coughs> excuse me, over the top of him. It formed a natural barrier. They wanted to touch him, but the barrier that was formed there was for a second purpose. The second purpose was so that he could teach them. He could preach. You know, I grew up on an island in Florida, and the house where I lived was right on the bay side, and we had mullet fishermen that would come at night, and they would put their nets out, and it was about two miles across that bay. Uh, but I remember my mother saying, you know, if you just listen, at night, the mullet fishermen are out there, and there's several boats putting their nets around, and it could be up to a mile away. They're talking to each other and we could hear them on shore. Because the water creates a, natu a natural amphitheater. It carries the sound in a most unique way. So we have the boat pushed off from the water, creating that barrier so he would not be thronged and overwhelmed, overcome, and he teaches them. He preaches them. We read that that was of prim primar primary importance to Christ. Back in chapter 1 of Mark, Jesus invites the disciples, he says, let's go to other villages, other towns, so I can preach there also. And the final phrase is, for that is why I've come. You know, the tendency is for us to clamor for, oh, the miracles if I just had the ability to do this or to do that, then, then wouldn't that lead people to Christ? And I look and I think about that, and this passage challenges me with the fact that the most important thing that we have, that we can do to influence those around us for Christ is to speak the Word of God to them. Not to look for miracles and signs and wonders. Those are secondary, and as we've seen, they will, they passed away, and they're not the prevalent there. We have the written Word of God, and we have the privilege of sharing it with the lost. Well, <clears throat> he healed, he taught. The third thing we see that he did was he cast out demons, and in verses 11 and 12, <clears throat> We read, whenever the evil spirits saw him, you know, somebody asked me a very good question. Well, let me finish the sentence. They fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. The person asked me, well, who was speaking? Well, it says the demon, the evil spirit, but it's not a, a disembodied spirit. It is the evil spirit speaking through the possessed. What an incredible consideration. Those that were filled, possessed by demons, had so little control of their own lives that the demons spoke through them. You are the Son of God. But then verse 12, we have what we've seen before. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. He commanded them not to proclaim who he was. And what did they proclaim? You are the Son of God. And we read that, and we may ask ourselves, why not? Why would he prohibit the demons from declaring who he was? Well, some have said, well, he didn't want publicity from Satan. Well, that may be valid to a point. 
But he didn't just only prohibit those who were demon-possessed from speaking who he was. We saw earlier he prohibited the leper from declaring what had happened, told him to be quiet, to go and show himself to the priests. So we see that there's something else going on here. Well, Matthew chapter 12 gives us a little bit of insight as this is described in a little more detail. And Matthew alone includes a prophecy out of the book of Isaiah. And verses 17 through 21, Matthew says, after the casting out of the demon, he says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. But listen to these next two verses. Descriptions of Christ. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out until he leads justice to victory. Isaiah describes the qualities of the Christ. A couple of things that that stand out to me, that first aspect of the fact that he will not quarrel or cry out. Christ never, the Lord Jesus Christ, never had the attitude or the expectation, or made it evident. Did he? He did not set him forth, set himself forth, in the manner that we have a tendency to do. He never said, "Look at me! Look what I just did! I just cast that demon out! I just healed that man! Everyone, come, come, because you see what I have." He didn't ever do that. You know, if he had lived in our day and time right now he would not have a TV show. He would not be out in the public with the cameras and the lights. Oh. Instead, he simply preached the word and allowed the Spirit of God to touch hearts. We have a tendency to want to evoke external responses from people. You know, and someone else asked me a very interesting question. Were all those people that Jesus healed, were they believers? Did they become believers? I cannot speak to that because miracles do not automatically make a person believe. Oh, those in his hometown said, do some of the things we've seen or heard, heard you do in other places. Oh, they wanted to see miracles, and if Jesus had done them, they would not have changed their heart, most likely. They just wanted to see some tricks. Yeah, we heard you do these tricks over there. Why don't you do them here so we can, we can be entertained? Jesus did not do that. And the other thing that comes out from this Isaiah passage is his incredible gentleness. A bruised reed? The only thing I can think of there is when... If I bought my wife roses <clears throat> and, you know, one of them gets broken or, you know, it's bent and it's kind of hanging on the, you know, out of the, the, the vase like this and I go like, oh, it's, it's just going to flop. I can't, and, and I'm thinking it's useless, you know, get it out of there or cut it off or, or whatever. And it's just so weak. It has no ability to stand up on its own. Jesus would not be harsh In any way, a bruised reed he would not break. A smoldering wick. Is there but a a spark in the life of a person? And that's barely there, but their lives are a catastrophe. He will not snuff out even that minimal amount. He would be gentle and bring it to life. And that is what he's done in so many of our lives, drawing us to himself. He never clamored for attention from the world. 
Well, let's consider the next major withdrawal, and that is to the mountain. In this portion of verses 13 through 19, we see that Jesus is about to appoint the twelve. <clears throat> in Mark 3.13, we read, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those that he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, designating them as apostles. <clears throat> I'm going to stop there, and I'd like to give you a little background. A little bit of background in regard to the Jewish mentality, the education of their children, and how that would affect all of their society. Every Jewish child was put into Hebrew school. The question was, when do we begin to teach our children? It's interesting that Josephus, the commentator in early New Testament times in the first century, said this, above all else, we pride ourselves in the education of our children. And that's evident because of Jewish society and the educational process. Another rabbi said, if not, if we do not hold our children's education up there, we are only one generation from extinction. That is so true. You know, we see that repeated so many times through the Old Testament. We have godly men and godless sons. There was a failure. We see men that, oh, they dedicated themselves to the Lord and they failed to train and to invest in their families. What an utter heartbreak. The Jews were told in, in Deuteronomy 6, these are the commands, the decrees, the laws that the Lord God directed me to teach to you, says Moses. <coughs> For you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land, flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. The exhortation to instruct our children is clear. Oftentimes the Jews would comply, but many times they did not. Another rabbi has said this, the world subsists through the breath of school children. And sometimes we may have a tendency to minimize these little ones. We minimize our input into their lives. <clears throat> rabbis would say that we accept children at the age of six as pupils and we stuff them with Torah like an ox. Interesting. We're going to put in as much of the Word of God as possible. And this first school was referred to as Bet Sefer, the house of the book. Ages 6 to 10, all children would attend, and they would memorize in those early years the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures. <clears throat> At age 10, the best of that group were invited to enter into a second school called Bet Talmud, House of Learning. And from ages 10 to 14, they would memorize the remainder of the Hebrew Scriptures. A rabbi's method of interpretation, understanding of the Scriptures, was referred to as his yoke. And a rabbi would want to extend his yoke 
by training others under him so that that would be expanded. Interesting that Jesus says to us, take my yoke upon you, for it is easy and it is light. Now, the final step, you'll see where I'm going to tie this into our passage. Please be patient with me. The final step was that the best of the best of the best were invited to approach a rabbi and to request to study under him, to be his disciple. And he would want that so that his yoke was expanded, that his method of interpretation and understanding was set forth. But the question would be, did that young person have what it takes? And the rabbi would quiz him. And if you were chosen, you would leave everything. And the phrase that described those who were now students of the rabbi was this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. That means that you were following them so closely in every area of life that as they walked and stirred up dust, it would simply get on you, showing that you were there, right with them, everywhere they went. Learning, being taught, being trained. However, there were not that many that were chosen, as you can well imagine. And if you were not chosen by the rabbi, you were told to go home, to marry, to make babies, pray for them to become rabbis, and to ply your trade. Go, study under your father, learn, work, be involved. So when we come to Jesus and the Sea of Galilee and he finds Peter, Andrew, James, and John as an example, what were they doing? They were fishing. Who were they fishing with? With their father. Why? Because they were plying their trade. Because no rabbi had thought that they were good enough. And when Jesus comes to them and he says, come, they dropped everything. And there had been intermittent connection with Christ through his first year. And we come to a very distinct time in Christ's ministry and life as we look at the remainder of this passage this morning. Yes, there had been connection, but now comes the shift. Jesus is about to choose twelve. Twelve that will be with him. By him choosing these twelve that we know of, fishermen, tax collector, zealot who would have slit anybody's throat because he was a revolutionary. All these folks that would not have qualified with anybody's, uh, they didn't have a resume, they didn't have experience in instruction and teaching, they didn't have the education that they really needed. By Jesus choosing these 12, he was expressing a final and complete rejection of the leaders, the religious leaders of the day. And they hated him for it. They hated him. It's a very interesting passage in Ezekiel chapter 34. I'll just read a few verses to you. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. 
Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel, who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you don't take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally, and so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild beasts. What an indictment against the religious leadership of the Jews. They had so become derailed from God's desire for them. So Jesus picks these 12. These 12? 12? He wants to influence the entire world with 12? That doesn't make any sense at all to me. And yet, he knew what he was doing. He's about to appoint these 12. And we see that there's preparation involved with the choosing of these 12. How challenged we are with choosing leadership correctly in verses 13 through 19. So we read that Jesus went up to the mountain. But Luke adds another important tidbit that's important for us to grasp. Luke 6, 12 says this, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. Okay. But it says that he spent the entire night praying to God. Even the Lord Jesus Christ needed to seek his heavenly Father's will an entire night before he made this final choice of these twelve. And he'd been with them. He'd seen them. He knew their hearts. He knew what they were capable of, both good and bad. He knows your heart, doesn't he? He knows what he can do with you, if you'll let him. So he took and he chose these 12, and I'm sorry, folks, I have to say it's a God thing. If he, here we are today, 2,000 years later, give or take a few years, and look at the influence that the Lord God has had investing in these 12. It says he called to him those that he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed the twelve, designating them as apostles. He set them apart, the twelve. There were many disciples, and that word in the New Testament, (coughs) excuse me, simply means learner. Oh, there were many disciples, many learners, many followers of Christ, but these twelve were designated apostles. And that word apostle is very distinct and very specific. It carries with it a tremendous meaning. It literally means to be set apart, to be sent, to be sent ones. And an apostle, a sent one, was acknowledged and respected and was to be received and understood that when they spoke, they spoke with the same authority of the one who sent them. Very significant. These were truly his representatives. So we set them aside, designating them as apostles. There are three reasons that we agreed why he did this. So that. It's a purpose clause. And it helps us recognize, aha, this is what He's doing and why. The first phrase is this, so that they might 
be with him. If you stop and think of that phrase in light of that background of these men, their early childhood training, the memorization, um, absorption of the word of God, and then not having been chosen by other rabbis, but now being chosen by this rabbi, they now were to be covered in his dust. They followed Christ every minute of every day. And they absorbed his words, his attitude, his heart, his compassion. And it soaked in. And Peter went from the disciple with a foot-shaped mouth to becoming the leader of the New Testament church, speaking the word of God clearly under the direction and power, empowerment of the Holy Spirit of God, where thousands would come to faith in a single event. He took and transformed the two brothers, sons of thunder, who had been guilty of saying, Lord, should we call down fire on those nasty people? And he transformed them into the men of God that they were. He took Matthew from a man full of greed and turned him to a man of sacrifice to walk with Christ. Simon the Zealot, one who would murder at a heartbeat as a revolutionary, turned him into a man of compassion and love. He transformed these men. He called them to himself that they might be with him. Secondly, he sent them out to preach. There it is again <clears throat> of first importance that they would speak the word of God. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thirdly, to drive out demons. And Matthew 10 tells us that that included healing. Mark doesn't bring that out. But what was that purpose? Again, to corroborate the message that these men would be sharing. It empowered them. <clears throat> we see that Christ had a purpose for everything. I'd like to just wrap up our time as we've looked through these. I can't even count that high. How many verses is this? Anyway, a lot of verses this morning. With some application considerations, some principles. First, I think of the, the care and the concern in, entwined with, with choosing those 12, choosing leadership. All that went into that. And I'm extremely grateful for this body of, of believers that is very careful the way they choose their leadership. They don't lay hands on suddenly as Timothy or as Paul says in Timothy, don't do that. You share in the sins of people when you do that. If you just look at the, the surface. Because not everybody is what they appear to be. <clears throat> the question I ask myself practically is this. What proofs? I can't heal anybody. Now, I've been in some situations with officers and their families, and I've prayed for the Lord. I ask permission for the family, and I pray for the Lord at their permission to take their loved one, and people have died practically on the spot. That means people say, well, I'm not sure I want the chaplain to go pray for us, because, uh, you know, that seems to, seems to come across that way. I mean, you can't do this this way, but it seems like, eh, you know, you kind of push them over the edge. The question comes, what proofs do you and I have to corroborate the words that we speak from the Bible as speaking the words of God? How is 
How are your words corroborated? How are my words corroborated in this day and age? I have no miracles. I have no gifts that I can point to, signs and wonders, nothing. John 13, 35 says, By this will all men know you, that you are my disciples, if you what? You're right. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters. That is one of the foundational points, the pinnacle principles that we are exhorted, that we love one another, and the world will witness that and see it. And what does that mean? We don't have time this morning to take that apart. But doing the best, not being self-serving, but considering others better than ourselves. Sacrificing ourselves, our comfort, for the sake of others in need. Secondly, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 2.17 says this, Unlike so many, we do not, says Paul, pedal or huckster the word of God. Oh my goodness. There are so many in our society that it seems to, to come across as they do it. Again, Paul says in Timothy, religion for profit. And that is to be condemned. We don't huckster or peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, we speak in Christ before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. It's not always easy for us to determine and see sincerity. Some people can wear a pretty good mask. We're all pretty fair at it. <clears throat> But we need to be a what you see is what you get kind of people. We need to be transparent in every respect. And that people know where we stand and we don't hide from that. And that any compassion or any service that we offer is not with an ulterior motive to gain something. That we speak as men of God with sincerity. And the final principle that I see in that regard as to how we are corroborated is what Jesus says in John chapter 16 about the Spirit of God, that the Spirit of truth, when He comes, He will guide you, speaking to the apostles, and I think by extension to all believers, He'll guide us into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come, and He will bring glory to me taking from what is mine and making it known to you. And I believe that our words and speaking the Word of God are corroborated by our always seeking to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and not ourselves. <clears throat> the third application that I see, and I believe to be as important if not most important, is going back to that phrase that the disciples, he called these apostles to be with him. I'm not aware of that kind of instruction, discipleship, mentorship. There may be a few places that it exists, but there is one place that it does exist and that is particularly young parents of children, young children, even older children. It is in your home. There is no greater place where you have the opportunity to impart life, the living word, into people making disciples. How crucial this is, and it is so dismissed in this day and age. I know that many of you sacrifice greatly to pour your lives, and you are, like Paul says, being, I know young mothers, sometimes you feel like you're being poured out like a drink offering. 
You are literally, your life is ebbing out of you and going in to your children. But that is scriptural. <clears throat> Remember the word, the world subsists through the breath of school children. Psalm 127 says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Interesting that the, the psalmist uses that word picture, arrows. Ha! Huh. There's not a guy in this building that doesn't like to shoot things. Why do we like, I'm sorry, I got Levi again, five years old. That guy has got more collection of plastic guns than anything I've ever seen. And he came to me with another cousin of his who happens to be sitting in here and says, Grandpa, teach us about guns. Okay, let's try to be wise about that. Why do we like to shoot things? Why do we like bows and arrows? Why do we like guns? Why do we like slingshots? Why? Because it enables us to have an effect beyond our reach. We get to touch something, reach out and touch something that we would not have a means of doing otherwise. And the psalmist uses this word picture to tell us that the training of our children enables us to have an effect, a much broader and extensive and expansive effect for the Word of God than you alone, we alone, will ever have. Because you get to send those arrows out and see God using, multiplying all those years of you pouring yourselves into those little ones. They are in your home. Maybe it's grandchildren. They are with you. They are there. And you have the opportunity to be with them. May we buy up those days. What kind of an example are we leaving to our little ones? What a joy. I know we grow weary. I know you grow weary. I get, I get weary too. But that's okay. Because we're exhorted to <clears throat> don't give up. Stand firm. Give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because we know that our labor is not in vain. Father, we want to be with you and to have others with us us that we can transform and see you transform lives by the imparting of your word and your heart to those around us. Thank you for the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ in choosing these 12. They never would have passed muster with us. But Lord, you've chosen us too and we don't, we don't qualify, but you know our hearts. And we thank you for the fact that you are able to take us and use us for your glory. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.